As an example, uh, let's assume, let's take a country that, that has accumulated a lot of debt and, and, and they owe the World Bank or one of these organizations uh, money. And they come back and say, well, you know, we, we need a new water system in one of our cities. For example, Bolivia did this with Cochabamba. We need a new water system. And the IMF at this point steps in and says, well, you've got a lot of debt, uh, and somehow we've got to restructure things. We've got to implement some policies that'll that'll rationalize this process. And so, yes, Cochabamba needs a new water system or better management. So what you need to do is privatize it because obviously the current system isn't working. And so the deal is struck that that there may be some money invested into that system if privatization occurs. And the privatization is rigged. You know, it's going to be one of our companies that's going to own it. In the case of Cochabamba, it was Bechtel, or a subsidiary of Bechtel. Uh, and they went in and developed the water system and restructured the whole thing in Cochabamba. And suddenly, water became extremely expensive for the poor people. They couldn't afford it. And they rebelled against it. And they were very, very upset and rebelled against it. And eventually, Bechtel was forced to leave. Um, but it didn't stop there, because Bechtel now says, well, you know, we've got lost profits. We expected to go in there and make certain profits. Now, legally, the United States and Bolivia do not have an agreement that allows a U.S. corporation to sue. So Bechtel used a subsidiary in one of its European countries, one of its own subsidiaries, that does have such an agreement, and went in and sued Bolivia for lost profits. Uh, that they hoped to realize and weren't able to because they had to leave under protest. And this suit went on for a while. After Morales was elected president of Bolivia, Bechtel dropped the suit and basically went away. But I think that example tells an awful lot because we set this thing up so that we put a country deep into debt, they come and look for something more, they need water, they need sewage, they need all kinds of things like this, for the, for the, really for the poor people. And the IMF then steps in and, and sets the guidelines. And it sets what it calls conditionalities. <laughs> and one of the conditionalities in this case, and in many, is to privatize, to turn the thing over to one of our, our companies. And that just perpetuates the system. And in the case of Bolivia, the Bolivians rebelled. And they elected a president who then was a real threat to the corporatocracy, and so Bechtel dropped the suit. If somebody else had been elected president of Bolivia, Bechtel, I'm sure, would have stayed in there with their lawsuit and probably would have eventually won it and gotten paid damages by Bolivia, but it didn't happen that way. And that goes on and on and on uh, in country after country after country. If we don't like what a democratically elected leader of another country is doing, for example, opposing uh, the exploitation of oil in his country, as Chavez is doing in Venezuela, or the exploitation of gas or water, as Morales is doing in Bolivia, uh, then we try to corrupt people into changing that and going back to the old system. And we try to corrupt those particular officials. So in the case of South America, in recent elections, uh, seven countries representing over 80% of, of South American population elected presidents that ran on an anti-corporatocracy platform. Now, these presidents did not run on an anti-American or anti-European policy. Uh, if I, as an American, go to any one of these countries, I'll be embraced with open arms. And they love our principles. They love our Declaration of Independence, but they hate having their resources exploited by us. That's, that's what they ran against, the corporatocracy. And once these presidents were elected, someone who looks like me, I had the job at one time, will walk into that president's office, speaks the language, speaks Spanish, whatever, Portuguese, walks into the office and says, congratulations, Mr. President, or in the case of Chile, Ms. President. And now I just want to remind you that I can make you and your family very, very rich if you play my game, our game. Or I can see to it that you're thrown out of office or assassinated if you decide to fulfill your campaign promises.
And usually it's said a little more subtly than that because there may be a tape recorder listening. But they get the message because every one of those presidents knows what happened to Arbenz of Guatemala and Allende of Chile and Roldos of Ecuador and Lumumba of the Congo and, and Torrijos and on and on. The list is, is very long of presidents that we have had thrown out or assassinated. There's no question about that. And they all know this. So we perpetuate the system that way. Here you offer, from this, hand, from this pocket, you offer a few hundred million dollars, corruption. Or from this pocket, you offer subversives, jackals, to go in and overthrow the government or assassinate the president. And if I'm in that position, if I'm the president, and even if I'm very integritous and I really believe in what I'm going to do, what, what, what I've said, well, what am I going to do? Because I know that they can do this. So I'm very tempted to accept the corruption because if I don't, I'm going to be taken out. And if I'm taken out, what's the next guy going to do? He's going to be scared to death. And so, yes, there are a lot of very corrupt officials. But who's doing the corrupting? We're doing the corrupting in most, most cases. And I talked about this on a presidential level, but it happens all the way down through the ranks. It happens at every governmental level, and it happens in the corporations in those countries, and it happens throughout the whole system. So if, if the corporatocracy does not like what's going on in Nigeria or Botswana or Thailand or any other country, they go in and they send people like me and they send the economic hitmen in and, and, and we try to corrupt the system. We, we offer the, the bribe and at the same time the threat and if the leader doesn't buy, then in fact we do send in what we call the jackals and they overthrow the government or they assassinate the leader. And this has happened time and time and time again. In Iran under Mossadegh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we overthrew a leader, a democratically elected leader, because he wanted to get more of the pro oil profits from Iranian oil to go to the Iranian people. We did the same thing in Iraq under Qasim who was a very popular president of Iraq and decided that he uh, wanted to get more of the profits from Iraqi oil to go to the Iraqi people, not to the foreign companies. So we decided he had to go. He had to be assassinated. We sent an assassination team in the early 60s. It was headed by a young man at the time who failed uh, and got, got, got wounded in the process and had to flee the country. That was Saddam Hussein. He was our hired assassin. He failed, so the CIA went in directly and had uh, Qasim publicly executed on Iraqi television and put Saddam's family in power. Um, we've done this time after time after time. Usually the economic hitmen are successful, so we don't need to send in the jackals. But on those occasions when we're not successful, as for me, I, was, I, was, I failed with Omar Torrijos in Panama and Jaime Roldos in Ecuador. And so the jackals were sent in and assassinated these men. On the very few instances when neither the economic hitmen nor the jackals are successful, then and only then do we send in the military. And this is what happened in, in Iraq. You know, we, the economic hitmen were unable to bring Saddam Hussein around. The jackals were unable to take him out. He had very loyal guards and he had look-alike doubles, so it was difficult to take him out. And so we sent in the military. And the first time we sent in the military, um, we could have certainly taken Saddam out at that point, but we didn't want to. He was the type of strong man that the corporatocracy loves. He could keep the Iranians on the, in their borders and keep the Kurds under control and keep pumping oil to us. And we figured that in 91, when we took his military out, that we had sufficiently chastised him that now he would come around. And he didn't. When the economic hitmen went back in in the 90s, he still refused, and the, the jackals were not able to take him out then again. So this time we sent in the military, and we did take him out. And the rest is history.